Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is technically solved, but I think there's a lot more going on than what this man has been convicted of. And honestly, I do think there has been a huge misjustice in this case. But before we get into the case, I wanted to give you guys a quick reminder to go ahead and check out my new Facebook page. I just launched it a couple of weeks ago. There, I post more short form versions of videos that I've covered here on my channel. So if you're looking for shorter form videos or just summaries on cases that I've covered in the past or cases that I'll be covering in the future, make sure you go ahead and check out my Facebook page. That Facebook page will be listed down below in the description box. But with that being said, let's get into today's case. Isabella Hellman was born as Lou Stella Isabella Rodriguez in Bogota, Colombia in November of 1975. And at some point in the 1990s, she moved from Colombia to Florida in the US. When she first moved to the US, she wanted to go to college, but she spoke no English. She had a very thick accent. And after taking some English classes, she decided instead to get a job and start working immediately. She settled in Palm Beach County, Florida, and she became an American citizen. She was described as being fun-loving, open-minded, and wanting to live in the moment. By February of 2002, Isabella married her first husband, William Hellman. The two were married for 10 years before they filed for divorce in 2012. The divorce was then finalized in August of 2014. I don't know a lot about the previous marriage or who William was or why their marriage ended. There's not really a lot of information on that aspect of this. But either way, at some point in 2014, Isabella had met a man online named Lewis Bennett. Lewis Bennett was born in April of 1977 in Dorset, England, and at some point during his childhood, he moved to Australia. He went to Bangor University in Wales and then Camborne School of Mines. He then went on to work in mining for a few years after that. By May of 2011, Lewis started his own business called Next Generation Solar, which was a solar panel company in Australia. Then by August of 2015, Lewis registered Next Generation Solar in Florida and he started practicing business there. When Isabella and Lewis first met, again, they originally met online, a friend of Isabella's said that their relationship started as a fling and it was pretty much only online. Lewis never was in Florida, mostly spending his time in Australia. But soon after the two started their fling, things got more serious. But even once things were more serious, Lewis would never really come visit Isabella. She was always the one who flew out to meet up with him in different places. She flew out to Southampton, England to meet his parents. Then he would be working at various ports in various areas, such as in Tati and Singapore, and so she would fly out to meet him there. Now, also going back to November of 2013, Lewis had purchased a 37-foot catamaran in St. Martin in the Caribbean. Then he eventually registered his boat to Australia, where he lived. So him being on that boat, he sailed the open seas as much as he could. He worked at different places. So that's sort of why he was always traveling around to all of these different places. But it's not really known how Isabella was able to afford to make these different trips or how Lewis afforded to go to all these different places either. This is something that we will discuss a little bit more later on, but at the same time, it was strange to those around them that Isabella was able to afford all of this travel. So friends and family members would ask her and all Isabella knew was that Lewis told her that he had some family money coming in. So that is how he was able to afford the lifestyle that he lived. Either way, by July of 2016, Isabella and Lewis had their daughter who they named Amelia. Isabella was so excited for the birth of her daughter and she had always wanted to be a mother. However, after the baby was born, it seemed that there was a lot more stress placed on the relationship between Isabella and Lewis, which is very expected when a couple has their first child. There's obviously going to be more stress. They're going to have to compromise on different things that they've never had to even talk about before. There's a lot of new things that happen and a lot of issues can arise but it seemed to be even more so between Isabella and Lewis. Isabella wanted to raise her daughter following Colombian traditions, such as piercing her ears, getting her an identity bracelet, and getting her a teething necklace. 
but Lewis didn't agree. He wanted to raise her following his own traditions. They would argue about every little thing on how to raise their daughter from what she would eat, what she needed to eat, and even what diaper she wears. Also, during this time, Lewis was trying really hard to get Isabella to move away from Florida and go with him to Australia, but she refused. These were the big things that placed a lot of strain on the relationship. Either way, by January of 2017, the couple purchased a condo at the Pine Ridge at Delray Beach Development for $123,000. Then, by February of that same year, the two decided to go on a getaway to Atlanta, Georgia, and there, the two got married. Then, a few months after that, by April of 2017, the two decided to go out on a delayed honeymoon together. By April 30th, 2017, Isabella flew to St. Martin in the Caribbean to meet up with Lewis, who flew in from Australia. Together, they boarded Lewis's catamaran called the Surf into Summer. The boat had come in from Australia on April 8th to St. Martin, and then the two left on April 30th when the two boarded and headed out to sea. According to Facebook posts made by Isabella, it showed that by May 1st, Isabella was in Puerto Rico, and by May 2nd, she had reached the British Virgin Islands. After that, nothing is known about where Isabella was until May 14th. At that point, she called a family member at 8.30 p.m. that night to let them know that she had been in Cuba. She had been staying at a resort town called Veradero, and around 5.30 p.m. on May 14th, that is when her and Lewis set back out to sea on their catamaran, heading to Key West or Fort Lauderdale in Florida, but they hadn't exactly decided yet on the exact destination. They were just starting to head in that direction. According to Isabella's family, she told them that the satellite phone had been malfunctioning the past few days as they were traveling and as they were in Cuba, but that it was now working by the time she called her family. She told the family at that time that they were heading home. However, by the early morning hours of May 15th, 2017, the United States Coast Guard received an emergency radio call from a bow located about 26 nautical miles away from the shores of the Bahamas. The caller was Lewis, and in the call, he told the operator that he and his wife were sailing on their catamaran, sailing from Cuba to Florida at the time. He said that on the evening of May 14th, 2017, he set the catamaran to autopilot and told Isabella to take watch as the boat traveled and to wake him up if she needed anything. By 8 p.m., Lewis said that he went below deck to go to sleep for the night. However, a few hours later that night, now going into May 15th, Lewis said that he was awoken by a crash that he felt underneath the boat. He said that he moved to the top of the boat and could not find Isabella anywhere. He said that the ship started to sink underwater, but he didn't take the time to determine where the flooding was coming from or what caused it. Instead, he immediately started gathering his items, he deployed his life raft, and abandoned ship. By 4 a.m. on May 15th, a helicopter spotted Lewis in his raft, and he was airlifted from international waters. From there, he landed in Marathon, Florida. After finding Lewis, the Coast Guard searched the life raft that he was on. On the raft, they found that Lewis brought a suitcase, two duffel bags, a backpack, unused parachute flares, buoys, a radio transmitter, 14 gallons of water, various food items, souvenirs from Cuba, as well as nine plastic tubes which were wrapped in clear tape, and they found that the backpack that the tubes were in were actually really heavy, so they unwrapped the tubes, and in the tubes, investigators found a bunch of silver and gold coins. Those silver coins were in the backpack, which he took with him when he was rescued. He left all of the other items on the life raft, and I'm sure, you know, investigators collected them after he was rescued. However, when they rescued Lewis from the boat and located the catamaran, Isabella was nowhere to be found. After finding Lewis, investigators asked him if he had put in any sort of effort to find Isabella after he saw that the boat was flooding, and he said no. He hadn't utilized any of the flares that he had on board. He didn't use the raft to search for her in the water after he abandoned ship. He didn't even yell for Isabella to see if she was near or do anything else to find her. Once he was on that raft, he immediately cut the tether and set off. 
He said that he cut the tether because he was afraid of being pulled under with the catamaran, and it also wasn't until he was on the life raft going away from the ship that he finally called the Coast Guard. So it's not like he walked around the ship, was looking for Isabella, was calling out for her, trying to figure out where she was as he was gathering his items and getting on the life raft, and then calling the Coast Guard to make sure that they could come as soon as possible. He gathered all of his items, including those gold coins and souvenirs from Cuba, put him on the life raft, and then left before calling the Coast Guard. In the days that followed May 15th, the Coast Guard deployed several ships and helicopters to conduct air and water searches, covering almost 5,000 square miles searching for Isabella but they could not find her anywhere. They did note that there was nothing in the water that could have caused hazard for the catamaran, meaning nothing that the boat could have hit hard enough for it to sink, as Lewis was claiming. They found no other boats, no shipping containers that had fallen off of a ship. They found no other floating or partially submerged objects in the water anywhere near where the boat was found or in the surrounding waters. Then, during their searches, the Coast Guard was able to spot the catamaran which was partially submerged in the water. They took photos and videos of the vessel to examine it, but they did leave it in the water and were tracking where the boat was using a satellite phone. So, there were two areas on the boat in which the holes of the boat was breached. The hull of the boat is the watertight body of the ship. It's essentially the body of the vessel that is submerged in the water. In a catamaran, they're set up so that they have two holes side by side. The two holes are separated by a gap, which sometimes can be wider than the hull itself. The reason for a catamaran to have two holes is so that it adds some stability, making it difficult for the catamaran to tip in either direction. This makes sailing on the catamaran a lot more comfortable and smooth when it's in the heavy seas. Two holes can also make the boat travel faster without worrying about it tipping. Within the two holes of Lewis's catamaran, police found damage that appeared to be coming from the inside of the hole, which was located almost in the same location on both holes. They determined that the damage had to be coming from the inside of the hole based on the spraying of the hole material outward. So they took a picture of the bottom of the ship, which they saw had a hole and damage to it, and the damage was so it was facing outward, so they knew that the damage was coming from the inside of the boat. But they also determined that based on the damage they saw, it didn't look like this damage was catastrophic. It didn't seem like it was enough damage for the boat to have capsized. Review of the damage found to both holes also found that it's not likely that an accident could have caused this damage. It didn't make sense that something colliding with the boat would have caused this damage to both holes in almost the same exact locations on both sides at the same time. They thought that this damage was probably caused intentionally from the inside of the boat. So somebody drilling holes into it or someone causing, you know, damage from the inside of the boat by like a hammer or pressing something through it in some other way. Then, they found that the escape hatches in both holes of the vessel were open. They stated that the escape hatch is located on the left and right cabins of the vessel. According to vessel and sailing experts, these hatches should have never been opened in the water unless someone is actively escaping through them. Opening these hatches is actually what would cause the water to enter the vessel and flood their respective cabin in which they are located. These ports being opened really struck investigators as odd since Lewis never mentioned them being open, even though he was sleeping in one of those cabins before he noticed that the boat was flooding. Again, he said that he went to sleep in the lower deck of the ship. That's also where these escape hatches are located. Then he said that he went to the upper deck of the boat and that's when he realized that it was flooding. He did say that the damage that was caused to the boat felt to be a crash that was coming from underneath, but he said that like it was tipping and that the top of the boat was flooding. That doesn't really make sense if the flooding started in the lower cabin from these hatch doors being open. And again, he never mentioned to investigators or the U.S. Coast Guard or anybody during all of this 
that these hatches were open. So it really just seems very sketchy. So obviously that part of this entire thing is a little bit suspicious and it points to the possibility that this wasn't truly an accident. But then investigators also found out that Lewis did not activate his satellite cell phone or register his personal locator beacon or PLB until he was already in Cuba. This was almost two weeks after Isabella and Louis set sail from St. Martin to Puerto Rico and then from Puerto Rico all the way to Cuba. So they had been traveling miles and miles and miles on the open seas and he hadn't activated these safety measures. So a personal locator beacon is a portable unit that you can wear that will emit a signal that rescuers can use to find you should you end up in the water and need rescuing. Then the importance of the satellite phone is so that you can stay connected even when you're out of cell phone range. When it comes to sailing across international waters, most sailors would have these life-saving measures activated and connected should they face any issues. But based on what investigators found, the PLB and satellite phone were not activated until the final leg of the trip. This told investigators that he wanted to ensure his own safety and rescue after intentionally capsizing his boat and getting on this life raft. So basically what they're saying is that the phone and PLB were not activated allegedly, until Lewis made the decision to kill his wife and he knew selfishly that he would need to use them to save himself. He did not activate them at the beginning of the trip because he wasn't worried about the boat capsizing or maybe also because he didn't want her using them to save herself if he did do something to her. Now, by May 17th, 2017, the Coast Guard were still putting forth efforts to track the catamaran and find Isabella. However, by that day, the Coast Guard reported that they lost signal of the boat. They did get the signal back momentarily and they tried to retrieve the boat, but eventually the boat sank in the water that was more than 4,000 feet deep, so they weren't able to retrieve the boat. To this day, they have not recovered that catamaran. Also, by May 17th, searchers noted that the water and air were 77 degrees, the wind was heavy at 17 miles per hour, and they said that it was just getting colder from there. Isabella was only 5 feet 4 inches tall, weighing 110 pounds, and she was last known to be wearing light clothing. So, based on those metrics, they determined that she would probably be able to survive in the water for about 13 hours. They had been searching for 120 hours at that point, so they knew that she had probably been suffering from life-threatening hypothermia. And unfortunately, by May 18th, the Coast Guard called off the search for Isabella, and to this day, she has not been found. Now, after Lewis's rescue, by 11.30 a.m. on May 15th, his family met him in Boca Raton to pick him up and take him home. By May 19th, the day after the search was called off, Lewis reached out to the Coast Guard asking for a letter of presumed death. Literally less than a week after she went missing, her husband, who should be fighting tooth and nail to find his missing wife, asks for a letter stating that she is presumed dead so that he can benefit financially. Well, investigators also found out that on May 20th, Lewis had also purchased one-way tickets for himself and Amelia, him and Isabel's daughter, to the United Kingdom. On May 28th, Lewis flew out to the UK with Amelia without telling anybody. He didn't tell law enforcement, he didn't tell Isabella's family, he just left. He did return back a few days later, but he did not bring Amelia with him. He left Amelia with his parents in England and refused to let Isabella's family see her. The family confronted Lewis about this when he was in Boca Raton, but he said that he's trying to do what is best for their daughter. The family did take Lewis to court to battle for rights to see Amelia. These court battles lasted for years, and I honestly don't know what happened with all of that. It's not very clear what the decision was. All I was able to see was that the judge in this case encouraged Lewis to let Isabella's family see her, 
but they continued to say that they weren't able to see her for several years. Now, as the investigation continued, police really started to believe that it was possible that Lewis may have capsized their vessel on purpose. And after talking to witnesses and examining cell phone records, investigators found out that there was a lot more going on behind the scenes than they knew about. First of all, those close to Isabella came forward to talk about the relationship between them and their daughter. They said that Lewis was a very absent father. He would leave at random times without telling anybody, and he was almost always away in St. Martin and at other Caribbean islands. And when he was gone, he would rarely call his family to check in on them or see what was going on. When he was home, him and Isabella slept in separate rooms. He also was controlling when he was home, and he was always angry about one thing or another. And according to witnesses, he was allegedly demeaning Isabella any chance he got. Then the family was dealing with some serious financial issues, which I will talk about more in a few minutes. But we find out that despite dealing with financial issues and not being able to pay their bills, only three months after Amelia was born, Lewis decided to fly to Thailand to attend a boxing academy. Those close to Isabella said that after their daughter was born, Isabella noticed a shift in Lewis's behaviors. He seemed to get angry even more often. She said to close friends that maybe Amelia was born at the wrong time because they just did not get along when it came to Amelia. Text messages from Isabella to Lewis show this crumbling relationship and it also shows that she may have been afraid of him in the years and months leading to her disappearance. On October 14th, 2016, she texted him, quote, I'm not perfect. Sometimes I can be a pain in the ass and more, but you need to change your attitude. You make me crazy, shouting, yelling, swearing. You are pushing me away. This morning, I was afraid to get home with coffee, but I walked in and I was right. I found an angry person. This is very sad. Then on November 28th, 2016, another text said, For first time, I'm happy you are away for a few hours. We need to get what we have before I miss it a lot. We have to learn how to live with our little daughter. We are living a new stage in life. We have to fight for our love. She went on to say, my heart is broken. If we don't change, we have to take separate ways. By December 5th of that same year, she wrote, if you don't like me or love me anymore, let us fix this ASAP because it's very pathetic the way you treated me all the time. I'm tired of you telling me I'm the most worst person you ever met before. Everything I do, it's wrong. On March 7th, 2017, she wrote, do not treat me bad. Think before you say those words to me. Then things seem to be getting worse, especially financially in the few weeks before her disappearance. On April 8th, she texted Lewis saying, thank you for making me miserable. I was so excited waiting for you. You came only to criticize what I do. That same month, she wrote, went to St. Martin and never told me. Not good. I thought we were not going to have secrets. On April 17th, she wrote, lovelies, I just got an email saying that they will disconnect the electricity. And on April 20th, she wrote, we are delinquent on taxes. Then, when police were searching the home that Isabella and Lewis lived in, they found several different recording devices that they later found out were placed by Isabella in order to record Lewis in different conversations. She was clearly afraid of Lewis and wanted to get on record what he was saying to her and what he may do to her. So, in addition to the crumbling marriage, as I've been hinting towards before, Turns out that Lewis was facing some financial issues as well. Lewis owed almost 2,000 Australian dollars in property taxes that he wasn't paying, and as we see, he was being faced with having his electricity turned off because they just were not paying their bills. They had thousands of dollars worth of debt on their credit card, which they were struggling to pay off. It also turned out that Lewis was trying to get Isabella to cut her maternity leave short and return back to work, but she didn't want to. She wanted to be home and raising her daughter. Now, throughout the duration of the relationship, Isabella had been under the impression for a while that Lewis was making money and that he was having money come in from the family, but she never really understood exactly how. And even though Lewis was struggling to pay things off and was leaving Isabella with the stress of these money issues and basically raising their daughter by herself, 
It turned out that Lewis had 160,000 Australian dollars transferring between international accounts between the years of 2014 and 2016. So clearly, Lewis had some sort of access to money, but he wasn't using it to help Isabella out or help raise their daughter. Now let's rewind just a little bit and talk about those silver coins that I mentioned earlier in the video. When Lewis made that call for his rescue, when he was found, investigators found those nine tubes wrapped in plastic and in tape, all which contained coins on his life raft. Turns out, back in May of 2016, Lewis had asked a friend who was the owner of a vessel called the Kitty R if he could hop on board and sail with them to St. Martin. And of course, given that the boat captain was a friend, he said sure. Well, during that same voyage, they docked at St. Martin and in the late night hours of May 5th, 2016, all of the crew members from the Kitty R went out on the town for some drinks. But when they returned, they found out that all of the floor panels on the boat were up and it looked like the boat had been ransacked. It was at that time that the owner of the boat realized that numerous gold and silver coins had been stolen from the vessel. By May 8th, he made a formal police report to the St. Martin police, and he had no idea who was responsible for it at this time. Those were the same gold coins that were found with Lewis on his life raft. Police also found additional gold and silver coins hidden on his property at the condo in Florida. In total, he was found to have been smuggling $38,000 worth of these gold and silver coins. But investigation determined that he wasn't the one who actually stole the coins off that boat. It was another crew member who, I guess, didn't go out with them for drinks. He was the one who physically stole them and Lewis was the one that was transporting them. Because of this, Lewis was actually arrested and charged with theft and by February 12th, 2018, Lewis pled guilty to one count of transporting stolen property worth over $5,000 in interstate or foreign commerce. By February 20th, he was sentenced to seven months in prison. At the same time that he was pleading guilty to this charge, almost a year after Isabella's disappearance, Lewis was also charged with the second degree murder of his wife. Investigators found that there were so many strange things about the whole situation that could point towards Lewis purposely sinking that boat in order to kill his wife. First, of course, the fact that he admitted that he didn't even bother to look for her before abandoning ship and just leaving. Also, the fact that the damage to the boat just did not seem like enough to have accidentally caused the boat to sink. Then they pointed to the fact that he didn't take the very simple life-saving measures that he should have. He was an experienced sailor. He had sailed many, many, many years, many, many, many miles, and he had the training to do the things that he should have done in order to find Isabella and save her life. The investigation determined that Lewis genuinely did not have to do a lot to prevent the boat from sinking and to try to find Isabella. Just a few small steps could have saved the boat and saved Isabella's life, but he didn't do any of it and he didn't even attempt to do anything. They also pointed to the text message evidence and clear evidence that they were in financial distress and they just were not getting along. The prosecution in this case theorized that as they were on their sailing expedition for their honeymoon, Isabella may have found out that the haul of stolen coins was on their ship. That could have caused an intense argument between them and that could have been the motive for how Lewis finally snapped and killed his wife of only three months. But after spending several months in jail after being arrested, Lewis actually came to a plea deal with the prosecution. They decided instead to charge Lewis with involuntary manslaughter. They lowered the charges to basically say that the ship was sinking, not caused by anything that he did, it was an accident, and that he just simply didn't do enough to save his wife. That is all. So basically, involuntary manslaughter is that you know, something happened, wasn't his fault, but his actions did unintentionally lead to the death of another person. Then at the sentencing hearing, he pled with the judge to give him as short of a sentence as possible so that he could raise his daughter. The charges of involuntary manslaughter really upset Isabella's family. 
they did not agree to the charges of manslaughter. Their lawyer explained that there wasn't enough evidence to show that he murdered Isabella, hence the manslaughter charge, but what I don't get is the involuntary manslaughter. If they think that he purposely sunk that boat, he definitely should have at least been charged with voluntary manslaughter so that his actions directly caused the death of another person. That, I think, is a lot more fitting than involuntary manslaughter. In a letter to the judge, Isabella's family wrote, quote, Lewis Bennett is being allowed to plead to involuntary manslaughter is outrageous to us. While our lawyer has explained to us that these facts are circumstantial and may not result in a conviction of murder, we strongly believe that the plea to involuntary manslaughter is not only insufficient, but actually less consistent with the facts than an acquittal or murder conviction would be. Then they said that the fact that Lewis won't let them see Amelia only makes things even worse. They went on to say, in over 18 months since Amelia was taken from us, we have not seen her. That is not from a lack of trying. We have tried, but Lewis Bennett's family lives in the United Kingdom and he has not instructed his family to allow us to visit her. We have had very limited FaceTime access to her, less than even one handful of times, and before she was taken from us, she was the light of our lives. But none of that mattered because at his sentencing hearing, he was given an eight-year sentence for involuntary manslaughter which to me just is not enough time. The U.S. Attorney's Office released their statement about the charge that Lewis got and they stated, quote, According to the stipulated factual proffer, Miss Hellman's death occurred as the result of Bennett's knowledge of circumstances that existed that could have reasonably enabled him to foresee the threat to life to which his acts or failures to act might subject another, namely Miss Hellman, and his gross negligence amounting to wanton and reckless disregard for human life in acting or failing to act as a result of that. So basically, they're sticking with the story that the boat was sinking by accident that, you know, something crashed into them and that Lewis just didn't do enough to save her, that he selfishly took all this stuff, took the gold coins with him, took everything with him, went on the life raft, didn't bother to search for Isabella, and instead was only worried about saving himself and his precious gold coins. Also, this entire time, like I mentioned earlier, Lewis was trying to get Isabella declared as dead so that he could financially benefit from her assets. It wasn't until two years after her disappearance that she was legally declared dead, and all of her assets went to Amelia, not Lewis, thankfully, so hopefully, Lewis doesn't see a penny of that unless Amelia chooses to share them with her father once she is old enough to get that money and once he is out of prison. But with that, that is where the case ends. Of course, Lewis is still serving time, but he will be released in just a few years, which is just insane to me. The fact that prosecutors were convinced that he purposely sunk that ship, there's evidence of marital problems, that he didn't choose to turn his phone or any other communication device on until right before her disappearance, that is at least enough to call this voluntary manslaughter. And even after getting such a short sentence, literally less than a decade for the death of his wife, Lewis still complains about being in prison, he complains about the conditions and all of the things that he's going through inside, which again just irks me knowing that he will still be released and still live an entire life. He'll be able to live out his 50s, an age that Isabella will never get to live. She will never get to see her daughter grow up, but Lewis will and that is just disgusting to me. In my opinion, and this is just an opinion, not fact, but it's based on the evidence that we've discussed up to this point, I think that something happened that night or Lewis planned something this entire time. I think that he harmed her on that boat and maybe her body was even somewhere on that boat when he deliberately sunk it. Or they got into a fight, he threw her overboard and there was evidence on the boat, so he sunk it. Because even if the sinking of the ship was an accident, the fact that he was able to save himself from the boat, as well as thousands of other dollars worth of coins, shows that he valued those coins over the life of his wife. And that in and of itself should show that Lewis does not deserve any lighter of a sentence. This whole time, he stuck to the story of, 
when the boat hit something, Isabella must have fallen overboard, and at the time, that's what he thought happened, so he didn't think there was any use in looking for her anywhere around the boat because she probably just sunk to the bottom, I guess. Honestly, if you woke up from a crash and you couldn't find your wife anywhere, even if you wanted to get everything that you could onto the life raft, you would think that he would drive the life raft around trying to find her because she was knocked off the boat and you would think that she would at least try to swim and try to keep herself afloat for as long as possible, at least for a few minutes after she fell off the boat, but he didn't even try to find her. The fact that he didn't even try to find her is very, very, very telling as to his motives and I am just... I'm honestly a little bit heartbroken that the charges were so little. It wasn't even voluntary manslaughter. It was literally involuntary manslaughter after the evidence showed that the damage came from the inside of the boat, that the escape hatches were open, that the safety measures were not turned on until right before her disappearance. All of those things show that clearly there's something more going on here. But I do want to know what you guys all think about this case. Do you think that Lewis purposely harmed Isabella and sank the ship on purpose? Or do you think that the ship sunk on its own and he just didn't care enough to save her? Do you think that eight years behind bars is long enough? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and give me a follow and like on that Facebook page and follow my other socials on Twitter and Instagram. Both will also be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!